I have old classmates from my time in Sweden that basically started everything from, from a small carpenter company to a bus company to software companies. And they never thought about the idea of them being an entrepreneur. They have 50 employees. They never considered themselves to be entrepreneurial in that way. That was just something you did out of necessity, maybe because that you were unemployable, maybe because you saw an opening. So, Chris, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate uh, your, your, your friendship and your dividing with us, the sharing with us, the you know, your thinking about the thinking that about uh, Chaos Pilot. But before uh, before we start uh, talking about the future of work, talk about a little bit about Chaos Pilot. You know, how did it start? What's it about? Yeah, so today we label Chaos Pilot as a school for creative leadership and meaningful uh, entrepreneurship. And we came about in a very changing time in the Northern Europe, into actually, actually in the whole of Europe, with the demise of Soviet Union and the rise of the New World Order, basically. And Chaos Pilot was thought of as, as a positive response to these challenges that were taking place in the world. We have been on that journey now for, the, for, the, for almost 30 years, and we tr still try to main maintain a direct contact with what goes on in the world, what are the challenges now, and what would be a proactive response to these. As a school, we are not a classical academic institution. We are more a polymath approach to leadership and entrepreneurship, where we basically invite people and we help them to deliver on their own dreams and values. So we support them with what we perhaps in the 80s or 70s would have called just-in-time management in terms of education and learning. We support them with networks. We support them with practical projects so they work on real assignments and real needs. So when they leave the school, they would have a portfolio of things that they have accomplished, not just a grade. Mm. And, uh focus um, be more on the future of work right i mean it's the topic mm. of your, your new book talk about a little yeah. bit about the, what's your new book about and uh, and what's the future of work that everybody wants to know and people... the uh, the topic of of future i think that if i think about my own um career so to speak that the topic of future it seems to never go out of fashion but the topic of future is one of these eluding themes that is always there. And you always feel as a leader that if you don't devote a significant amount of time and thought to it, you are basically betraying the job and the responsibility that you're having. I wanted to take a slightly different approach because it is still so that we as a school believe in agency. We believe that people can make a difference, maybe not for the entire world, but certainly for themselves, for their families, for their companies. The decision that you make as a CEO do have significance, maybe not for, the, for how the world will develop in 20 years, but certainly for everyone that works with you. Great. Today, you know, in today's world, uh, there's a lot of questioning about uh, the skills mm. and talents to thrive in this new world where uh, schools are not teaching actually the skills mm. that people need to operate. And you, you have a whole chapter on that uh, on your mm. book talking about that uh, a little bit, uh, skills mis mismatches and talent shortages. Should, so, yeah, so... Partly, if you look at Chaos Pilot, which has always been more skill-oriented rather than simply knowledge-oriented, so the, the type of education we provide provides people with skills. But in addition to that, we also focus a lot about attitudes. They tend to overcome gaps or mismatches in their own life with whatever one they want to try to accomplish. So providing that attitude towards self, others, and the world seems to be one of those key things that we need to equip our younger generation with. It is also so that in a world where many of the books, many of the magazines that we consult, they are aimed at a part of the population that indeed I too represent, but is not necessarily fully representative for the entire population. Many people are left behind. Many people feel left behind. And when you read sometimes about, your, for instance, the automatization, it's, it seems like there will be no jobs left at all in the future. 
whereas we know that previous technological revolutions have actually provided more jobs than ever existed. It was just that we could not conceive what those jobs would be. Great. Um, and you talked about also the revival of arts and humanities, you know, where everybody's talking about technology and suddenly you're talking about arts and humanities, the future where human skills rule. Where yeah. does that fit in today's technology-driven world? I think it depends to some extent on how much belief we have in that technology will become everything we are and more. I am not going to rule out that that is, a, that is a striking possibility in the future, but I don't see that happen anytime very soon. Certain things for sure, absolutely, we already see that, so that's not shocking. But I do think that big questions like creativity, decision making, ethical concepts, dilemmas, all of those type of things will become increasingly important in a time of increasing technological dominance. Someone needs to make the right judgments calls in all of this. Someone needs to think out of the box. Someone needs to be outside the box, right? And we believe uh, from what where we are that what we normally refer to as arts and humanities could actually be one of those things where we look at people and say, how do we develop you in the school to be a well-rounded leader? Mm -hmm. You don't need, maybe don't need to be an exact expert when you leave this school, for instance, but you should have the capacity to move in many different directions. Uh, in my lifetime, I have never seen so many uh, startups being uh, founded mm. in Brazil by younger people yeah. and even some older people, you know. Mm. Uh, and then you talked about the new face of startups and what millennials are really looking for in seeking out startup life. Curious to, to know what uh, your what are your thoughts behind that? Yeah, startups is something that I've um, obviously always, always been there, but I think that if we take our part of the world. For the better of the 25 years, the importance that we have placed on startups have been consistently increasing. It seems sometimes when we read a business magazine up here or we hear politicians that the answer to every question is more and better entrepreneurship. I, my experience with working now within, within that field for, for 20 plus years is, is very much that on one hand, entrepreneurship is very much a question of identity, that people adopt the, the idea of being an entrepreneur in a very, in different ways. I have old classmates from my time in Sweden that basically started everything from, from a small carpenter company to a bus company to software companies, and they never thought about the idea of them being an entrepreneur. They have 50 employees. They never considered themselves to be entrepreneurial in that way. That was just something you did out of necessity, maybe because that you were unemployable, maybe because you saw an opening. But there has been a larger shift that we want more people to move into that direction. And that leads me to to the second side to where schools and others come in is that entrepreneurship is not just a goal. It is always, it's also a mean to develop skills, attitudes, capacities in a different way. Being a good entrepreneur perhaps means that you are good at collaborating with others. Being good at understanding uh, value decisions, product developments means that you can be an enormously well-rounded uh, middle manager perhaps in the future. So we see with our students a very interesting development from, from previous, maybe 20 years ago, where people today speak less about a career and more about the multitude of careers that run in parallel. Mm -hmm. They go to school, they work for someone, they have their own startup, they have their own NGO, and they don't necessarily distinguish between these ones and they don't necessarily see that as a problem that they have scattered focus as mm -hmm. one of my previous students said we are the maybe generation we always mm -hmm. operate in this in between yes and no do you see the need of going to schools uh, to a business school five days a week <laughs> no to be honest not the um we do we do have that at our schools in a way i'm speaking against our own setup I for think, five years. <laughs> yeah the, i i think the um the future more is how can we consider our business schools to be a lifelong partner for students because if it is as i detect with my students that they don't differentiate between being a learner a creator 
a leader, an employee. They don't see that these things work against each other. And if so, I don't see five days a week as as a as as a possible solution, as possible answer to that. The schools need to come to the student, as opposed to the other way around. Mm -hmm. Talk about uh, leadership. You know, everyone mm -hmm. wants to be a, a significant leader in in, in their mm -hmm. companies and their lives. And uh, how mm -hmm. about uh, your vision on leadership, uh, Chrisir? I was asked the very same thing yesterday by my new list, the students that had just started, and they say, what do you actually do? And they said, what is your view of leadership at the Chaos Pilot? So I was confronted with it, a bit unexpected, but I was confronted with it in a, in a, in a good way. And I like the old classical Lao Tse orientation about invisible leadership. I like the idea of, of some sort of collective claim to fame. Mm -hmm. Uh, if, if, so if that answers your question, those are perhaps the three domains where I try to navigate. And, and uh, as I told my students, I think a good leader, at least at Chaos Palace, if I get run over by a train tomorrow, it will take a month before things start to become difficult here. Mm -hmm. I have created an organization that can maneuver, that doesn't need my interference on every single topic at all times. Mm -hmm. Chris, we're going towards our last question here. The age of actualization, is there peace between, is there peace to be made between purpose and profit? You know, yeah. and there's never been a time uh, about uh, where purpose came so much, so strongly into companies. Yeah. But what's yeah. the relationship between purpose and profit? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting, I actually wrote uh, an article once, which was called The Purpose of Purpose. And I started by asking the question about uh, what did we have before? Surely companies had something. They, we, we had everything from vision to mission. And, and even before that, there was something. Very often you had an entrepreneur with some sort of idea of why they wanted to start it, what they wanted to accomplish. Sometimes very egoistic reasons. But very often when I've spoken to entrepreneurs over the years and leaders over the years, they do have a positive view of how they can contribute. Mm -hmm. I actually don't meet many CEOs that says, I just want to screw society and get the most money myself. I actually don't. I meet very few people that say that. And we mm -hmm. see it in terms of environmental issues and we see it in terms of uh, inclusiveness and taking care of people in society and so forth. I would not be so bold as to have a claim of what is a justifiable purpose what is the right purpose what is a good purpose but i do think that there is good business to be made for any company to have clarity on what is it that you do that make the world a slightly better place than if you would be gone chris sir thank you so much i i had ended but i came back <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. So we'll come back. You know, you you have so many interesting things to say. We'll definitely come back for more. And Thank uh, you. congratulations. Uh, good luck with your new book. And I'm always here to give my you know my uh, input on your your work and your future. So thank you so much. Thank you.